Good morning. My name is Marcy Strumgren and you've tuned in to Just the Facts. I have a guest in the studio today and some of you may be familiar with Art Johnston. He served on the uh, Duluth School Board for um, eight years and uh, is now running for um, an office that I'm going to let you let him tell you about and so welcome and thanks for coming hey, in Art. Great Marcy, good to see you. Good to see you as well. well thanks for inviting me as usual. Well. I think you have an important role that you're seeking uh, to provide for the uh, citizens of our area and so I'd like you to explain to uh, the public what office you're running for, where your district, uh, what the boundaries of your district are, how long would that position be, if, should you be elected in November, so we'll let you talk to the audience about that. Uh, sure. Well, I'm running for Minnesota House 7B. That includes West Duluth. The Minnesota House, just like the federal, there's a Senate and a legislature. Senate and a House. Well, in the Minnesota, there's a Senate and a legislature. And we're, we're the House part. There's 62, I believe there's 62 House members. I think there's 32 districts, something like that. may have that wrong, don't quote me. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's, there's, there's, for every Senate district, there's two uh, House members and the Senate District 7, which is Duluth basically, uh, 7B is West Duluth. So I decided to run for that uh, this time around. Um, what are the boundaries? Uh, what is the district encompass so that people looking at this will understand whether you're in their district or not? Sure, 7B goes from Fond du Lac on the west side up to Hermantown, part of Hermantown actually. Then all the way over to is past Masaba, I believe is at Sixth Street West, uh, and then down to the lake, and it includes Minnesota Point. It does. As well, okay. Yes. Yep. So Minnesota Point and all of West Duluth, Minnesota Point is kind of different. When I was on the school board, I was represented District Four, but that did not include different from the from the legislative districts and didn't include Minnesota Point okay. nor any of the places up by Hermantown or part okay. of Proctor too. I believe that Proctor is included in my district as well. So you're fairly familiar with uh, the area that you're covering. Are you canvassing this door-to-door? Uh, uh, -door? Are you mailing or how are you going to be letting people know? Well, the campaign really hasn't heated up. We don't have a primary. Remember, the primary is, uh, what is it, August 11th, 11th. Mm -hmm. about two weeks from now. So I haven't started campaigning a lot. Uh, I know my opponent isn't either. Uh, but when I start, you know, I will be waiting until after the primary just because everything is so busy right now with the primary. Uh, and you just get lost if you're going to do the primary stuff. And campaigning is hard work, so I'll be concentrating on that probably in about another month or so I'll be doing hard. Canvassing some, yeah, but the whole coronavirus, I'm not going to do as much of that as I have before. Campaigning is actually pretty hard now, and I think it's hard for the voters too, because you don't have any meetings anymore, or any any big meetings, and like the West Duluth Business Club doesn't meet anymore. Uh, none of the political parties are meeting in person. And uh, yeah, we all have Zoom meetings and all that, but it's just hard to get to know somebody and it's hard to get up and introduce yourself and shake hands. You know, we can't even shake hands anymore. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit hard to campaign. It's hard for people to find out hey, who's running. And, and of course, thanks to you, we're going to have some publicity. The Duluth News Tribune, of course, is totally worthless when it comes to anything. Uh, so they will barely even talk about the race and they won't talk about me because they don't like me, of course. Uh, so they're very biased and uh, they don't, but even at best, they have very few forums. They don't, last time around, they didn't even record any of the, the few forums that the were had. So it's going to be tough. So it depend on, I'm depending on a little bit, social media. I have a person running with some of my Facebook page and my website. And yeah, granted, I admit that it's not particularly good. Yeah, I'm not a polished, slick candidate, and I don't want to be, and I hope people look at my stuff will see, hey, this is a real person who's running for real issues and doesn't depend on slick PR firms to make me good. Have people go on my past record, I hope, 
and, and which is on the school board. I'm quite popular in West Duluth and people know me. I mean, even the Duluth News Tribune knows me quite well. They tried to bury me, of course, but uh, they weren't successful. We won two lawsuits against the school. Uh, and the whole thing there was getting transparency and having citizens of our town know what's going on with the school district. And of course that was a real good uh, segue, I hate to use that term, into what I'm doing now which is running for 7B. I think it's a better fit for me since I'm a uh, school board, you're only talking about school issues. And uh, uh, it should have been a, you know, good for me too because hey, I'm a I'm a structural engineer, I know all about contracting, and I know all about energy consumption in buildings, and that's a part of being, you know, we have, have a lot of buildings. Uh, but the school board and the administration did not want any knowledge on that at all. Uh, but now with the office I'm getting now, we talk a lot about, it's going to include schools because we, of course, uh, K-12 funding is the highest budget item in the state uh, budget. So that's certainly going to be, so I'm going to take that expertise that I know in the school and put that into looking at the budget. And, you know, of course, I got a lot of ideas on that. And one of my issues, of course, is should the schools be opening up? Yes, I think we should, but I'm getting ahead of myself. But, you know, also we've got a lot of things going on in the state now about uh, uh, coronavirus stuff, which everybody knows about. Uh, we have a lot of stuff going on in West Duluth, which is really depends a lot about the policies that the state makes. Now, I'm running in West Duluth, but I'm not, that's not the city council. I don't have anything to do directly with industries closing, like uh, Verso, for example. But yet, we can have a lot of impact on the DNR policies. We can have impact on where bonding comes. Say, for example, the uh, Port Authority, they get a lot of bonding, which I think is very important. And uh, so those are issues which I'm a very technical person. Oh, another thing we have, uh, just as on the port, we have a lot of uh, service facilities. Uh, we have a lot of vendors in West Duluth that supply mining industries, supply the logging industries, supply the trucking industries. And of course the port is dependent on, uh, on resource industries. And the port is the biggest part of West Duluth. The port is in right in the center of 7B. And it's, it's interesting, none of my opponents, none of the uh, DFL talks at all, if you look at their literature, doesn't talk at all about the economy of Duluth. None. And I think it's important that people acknowledge that we have to have jobs here. And of course the coronavirus has even made it worse. So, But anyway, so that's why I'm running. I think we have to have a little bit of rational decision making. We have to, we have, government should be here to not hinder commerce, but to uh, facilitate it and make promote commerce it. work. Yes. And uh, yeah, social issues, yes, but we can't have good social programs if we don't have a robust economy. And right now, the Duluth economy is really bad thanks to a lot of the policies that the state has done. And since I'll be running, working in the state legislature, having control of budgets, you know, I think I can make a big difference on really helping out the Duluth economy grow and just make West Duluth a more better, more equitable spot, a more place that we want to live and where we can live and we can afford houses and we can have jobs so we can actually live here. So that's kind of why I'm running. Well, that kind of sums up everything that uh, we set down as what we want to cover here, but we'll go over these in detail. And uh, I'm going to go back a few minutes because uh, while Art was on the school district, um, I monitored the school district with my camera from the PAC TV uh, student, uh, offices here. And I know what Art is all about. I know that he uh, gets on an issue and does thorough research on it and brings forth that information. Now, if you go up against a bunch of people who don't really care to listen to it, as he did, and got stonewalled with everything that he presented. But some of his background um, figures in here, Art, uh, what type of work did, you, maybe you're, well, you're still doing some of your work, but you were employed by the forestry. Yeah. The right. government. Right. I would say. So while in the government, you had certain guidelines you had to follow when you submitted um, proposals and everything. They didn't just write on it and say, good, go. It all was gone through processes that made sure that what you were designing was 
going to fit what they had a need for. So you use some of that expertise while you were working on the school district and you saw holes in the red plan and you tried to do something about that. But like we all know, you got stonewalled and then um, you had to get an attorney to uh, defend you and then uh, you couldn't get what is stated in the law, data practices acts, give him the right, actually gives you you, a citizen. Now this, this fellow was an elected official and he could not get the information from the school district. And so eventually you did win, after you were off the school board, you did win a small portion of, um, recoup some of the money that you had lost because they finally allowed you to have what is actually in the law because you had to take another lawsuit out against the school district, correct? Yeah, yeah, it's, you, you summarized that a lot, I think, and I can uh, go into a little more detail on that, which I think is kind of important, is that uh, uh, the school board, the school administration, I should say, they tried to remove me from the school board. Right. And imagine an elected official being removed by a majority vote on any board. I mean, obviously, if you can look at that, there'd be chaos in every government. Well, there obviously is chaos in the Duluth public schools because of such a policy. And of course, I fought that, and of course, I won. Uh, but it came out of quite high economic cost, uh, financial cost to me. <clears throat> but it's. But one reason I'm running for the you know, state legislature, could you imagine somebody, the state legislature, voting on a majority vote to remove one of their duly elected members? Uh, that's a little bit hard to believe. But yet the Duluth News Tribune bought into that. You know, Duluth News Tribune hates my guts. Uh, sorry, Marcy, but they do. And they did everything they could to remove me and destroy me as a person, despite me being an elected official. Uh, they never gave me any good reporting. They never did anything. Now, in the state legislature, that's not going to that's not going to happen. Now, is there nasty stuff going on there? We all know, looking at the federal thing, they've tried to remove a duly elected president. Uh, we know that gonna, that's going to go on, but there's a whole lot more checks and balances in the state legislature. And if I get elected, that stuff will will not happen. And the Duluth News Tribune may want to. Uh, laugh about it, but they will not go after to try to remove a sitting state legislator that was duly elected. So, so I have a lot more protection as a, an elected official being elected into the state. And also remember, the school board elections, they, uh, this is by design, Marcy, uh, they're on off-off year elections, uh, which means that nobody comes out to vote. Uh, the media in this town, including all the media, not just the Duluth News Tribune, but the TV stations, they do virtually do not cover schools at all. I mean, it's such it's just a drop in the bucket. And as a as the schools and or the elections going for, for for school boards, so we literally had you know I did lose my last election because we had a 28 percent of the people voted. Uh, why it wasn't wasn't advertised by anybody? Of course, the school's not going to advertise it because people that have special interests in the schools they always vote like the teachers, uh, and of course they don't like me. And of course the DFL has got the, the DFL machine in this town, and uh, so when you have 28 percent of the vote, that's only the people that vote. Now we're going to have a lot better chance. This is going to be this is a presidential election year. Who typically votes about 70, 75 percent in presidential elections. That's going to really be, I think, a boon for normal people that they are going to get out and vote. They're going to look at my name. They're going to know me. They know my history on the school board. I mean, I'm quite popular in West Duluth. I think it's going to be a very competitive race, even though I'm not part of the DFL machine. And the DFL, of course, has went against me, of course, as they always have, even though I used to be part of the DFL, remember, and now a walk-away Democrat, uh, which we could talk about too if you want. But it's, I think it's going to be a lot better chance for the people of Duluth to actually have a say in, their, in this election versus what they had on the school board, which was no publicity whatsoever. Well, I won't waste any of our time about the school district and how they uh, get their people out to vote. Uh, that'll be for another, another uh, 
studio shoot, but I want to I want to focus in on you and some of your main topics. And uh, we briefly talked about the Port Authority, and you had uh, told me economics. So do you want to just expand that a little bit more? Yeah. yeah. The economy. The, the economy, economy. The economy in Duluth. It's, uh, and first of all, I want to say my opponents, if you look at their literature, they don't talk about the economy of Duluth. They talk about all their special interest groups that endorse them. And, you know, and I, I was looking at some of their literature, not my opponent because our race isn't up yet, but some of the other DFL people running at Duluth in it. I look at that and it's just one, a whole thing of special interest groups. Doesn't mention Duluth once. Doesn't mention the economy in Duluth once. It doesn't mention the unemployment in Duluth. So let's go back. And so I think it's just really important for people because we do need jobs. Some people just can't sit around and be supported by special interest groups. Most of us have jobs to do, and, uh, and our families do, and our kids, and uh, everything. So let's look at Duluth. Uh, uh, of course, the biggest thing that happened here uh, a month ago was Verso, actually less than a month ago, Verso, the paper mill uh, uh, in town, it closed down at the end of July. It's closed down, uh, actually end of June, excuse me. Uh, that was built back in, when, 1989, somewhere 87, I think. That's, that, that is a big employer. And you know, I was over there, uh, I do videos and stuff talking about this. Uh, there's, not only do they have employees, they had about 300 employees, which of course have lost their job. Hmm. But this is also supporting the trucking industry. There's a lot of trucking industry sure. in Duluth. There's a lot of vendors that come in and work on the plant, the HVAC people, the engineers that work in the yes, plant. Surely. And that's all shut down. And uh, as far as I know, the city did virtually nothing to do it. Our state legislators did nothing to do it. Why did they shut down? There's a lot of reasons. Uh, the paper, well, there's actually two big reasons. One, because of the coronavirus uh, lockdown in our in our our world economy, actually, it has really reduced the amount of paper. So that has been the number one thing. But also things there's a lot of people don't know is that uh, the utility cost to run that paper is fairly energy intensive. That's why they often have mills near waterfalls and stuff that was originally where they got their, their energy from. Uh, but uh, Minnesota Power has been raising their rates, a lot of it because of this alternative energy mandates, and that's caused our rates to go up. And uh, so it's a combination of those two things is that they decided they shut down. They were not given any breaks by Minnesota Power. As far as I know, my opponent did, did nothing to uh, try to get Minnesota Power to keep their rates reasonable. And, uh, and, and of course, the coronavirus, we know Minnesota is shut down, it isn't just Minnesota. But a combination of that, that is, that, that is such an example of what the coronavirus lockdown has done. It has shut down one of the biggest plant in West Duluth, and that that was built to try to give employment to West Duluth, and has been there for what, 30 years now. Uh, so that's that's number one thing. Verso was uh, shut down, and I don't know if they will ever open. I don't see the town, city, the state negotiating with them to try to open up again, uh, and uh, that's a very sad situation for employment in Duluth. Big time. Uh, mm. Yeah. Uh, other things. This isn't the only thing. Bruce wasn't the only thing. You know, the Kmart in West Duluth was well, shut down. That's been now what six months ago. Kmart shut down. We don't have any actual uh, shopping shopping types of things left in West Duluth. We have Menards where you can go buy you know, hammers and nails and tools. Us us men, we like to go to Menards because we can come back with a load of tools. Uh, you can buy building materials and stuff. Well, a lot of women are doing that now too, so we got to <laughs> yeah, be careful but, there. Yeah, but yeah, they, they actually but, have groceries and stuff in there. But, but yeah, everything it, it, like computers, keyboards, uh, 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 SD disks, uh, clothes, uh, food, that Kmart, I think that was a big employer in West Duluth, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, big, it's a real big hit. Uh, and, uh, and of course, all the other, all the other 
industries, industries, uh, businesses in the West Duluth. We have the microbreweries, yeah. We have the Mr. D's, for example, uh, you know, the most common, well-known uh, bar restaurant in West Duluth is still not open. Uh, the other restaurants are kind of half opened and half not. You know, nobody's going out to eat anymore. Everybody's scared to death to even talk to their neighbors anymore. And we could talk about that. I think some of that's overblown, but hey, that's, you know, I would like to talk about that. I mean, coronavirus is a real thing. It is killing a lot of people. Uh, but we should, it's a risk management that we should be talking about. And getting back to is the coronavirus's effect on, let's say, St. Louis County. I haven't been able to find any data for Duluth. But the last I looked at in uh, Minnesota Health and Human Services, there has been since since the whole April lockdown, we've had 30,000 people apply for unemployment just in St. Louis County. Just St. Louis County. Nationwide, it's supposedly going down some. Uh, the, the number of people who are applying for unemployment nationwide is 40 million people. Uh, some people kind of say, oh, what doesn't impact me? People like the teachers, they're still making their 65000 a year by sitting at home in their pajamas and uh, doing education on there. A lot of bureaucrats, and I'm included, I, I am a working engineer still, and uh, I have my own business now, and yeah, I do a lot of my work at home. I'm doing all right. But you're working. I am working. A lot of people are not. Uh, you get people in the music industry, the service industry, like bars and restaurants, uh, the sports industry, the sports industry is, you know, we don't know if the sports industry is even going to survive. Then you get to higher education. We have a lot of higher education in Duluth. Duluth depends a lot on getting, uh, I don't have those in West Duluth, but Duluth itself. Uh, we have uh, uh, students are probably, they're probably not going to be opening this fall. Our high schools and our grade schools probably are not going to be opening. And in the colleges in particular, that means there's a lot of college kids in Duluth that are not going to be here. And there won't be those kids renting all of these houses that people have turned right. into right. rental, so there's less income there. It, it, yeah, we got 26,000 people or 30,000 people unemployed in St. Louis County. Uh, a lot of those, and now you add to that the students that are not coming back. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention was Essentia Health. They're building a $500 million facility, which is really good. It's nice to see some cranes in downtown Duluth building buildings. Again, that's really important for our economy. Unfortunately, they also laid off a thousand people. And, you know, that's, uh, what did the city do to stop that layoff? Nothing. Uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the medical people, the, you know, the, 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 the people that are nursing, the nursing union has been fighting that very hard and I'm a big union supporter, as you know, and I hope you ask me about that. Like, huh, how come they're laying off all these people and they're building a $500 million facility? Uh, that's, a, that's a big hit in Duluth when you lay off that many people. I know nurses, and you know with the coronavirus aren't the medical people supposed to be uh, available. Uh, well, available and the necessities uh, requirement. And why did we lay off? It wasn't all just nurses we laid off, it was all administrators too. But uh, why are we laying off people? And, and now some of my data is old on this, but the last I talked to some of the nurses, there was zero coronavirus patients in St. Luke's, zero. Yet they're laying off all kinds of people because they were waiting for this surge of cases to come in. So again, poor government planning, uh, laying with the, the, the hospitals had to lay off people because they could not do any elective surgery. People that have, uh, that people don't dare go to the hospitals anymore. Uh, you have people that are not going in for normal checkups, not getting getting their, their cancer screenings and all those. So the amount of people that, that uh, this is really impacting not just the hospitals, but people that don't dare go to hospitals anymore because of the fear that's going on there thanks to our government policies here. If we want to take care of our people, we know how to do that, but we can't do that when half our hospitals are uh, laid off half their people. Well, I think we covered number two pretty good on the coronavirus, so we'll jump into mob rule. But I'm going to start out by saying all these governors that shut down their states and South Dakota woman governor, Republican woman governor, bless her heart, said 
my people are intelligent enough to make a decision whether to stay at home or not. I'm not going to shut my state down. There's never been a large amount of coronavirus. And my husband did some statistical stuff. In Minnesota, per 100,000 people, 20. 20 per 100,000 people, coronavirus. Those are pretty low figures per 100,000. Then he got some statistical information worldwide. It's like zero, 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 three point some, or point zero, 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 three, five or something like that. So it's all about control art. The governor had no right to supersede the legislature. That is the legislature's job to make those decisions. The governors have been doing this. They've been jumping over the legislative process to have control over things and mandating masks and mandating this and mandating that. It is not within their realm to do it. But that's what we got. That's what we got in Waltz. And that's what other states got with their, their governors. Now, in Florida, the Republican governor, he shut down his state. I think I can see a little difference because there's a whole lot of illegal immigration going on down there. And so I believe that what he made, that decision was probably correct. But we don't have that problem up here. We don't have it in a lot of other states. So mob rule by a dictator in the state of Minnesota who was elected to represent the people has now felt that he has to control his people. Well, I guess I disagree with you a little bit, Marcy. I agree with a lot of the stuff you said, but uh, uh, you know, the coronavirus is a very serious thing. It is more so than, than the flu, it is more so than car accidents. Uh, it is a infectious disease, which is very contagious. Uh, but now having said that, uh, the people well, let's go back a little bit in history. We had the Spanish flu back in 1918. Mm -hmm. We had polio. We've had diphtheria. I grew up, many, I grew up many, with the polio business. Yep. We had diphtheria outbreaks throughout. My parents used to tell me about diphtheria outbreaks back in the 30s. And uh, those uh, things, what we did, we quarantined people that had those so they wouldn't infect the rest of our society. Now it's just backwards. We're quarantining people that are, are not that are not going to get the disease. I mean, the chance of somebody under 50 getting the disease is almost nil, uh, particularly if you don't have any, any of these other issues that go along with like being overweight, high blood pressure, diabetes. Uh, so we're having our most able people in our society that are not liable for, the, uh, for this disease. We're having them being in their basement bunkers and they should be out there working and helping out people. We do have to quarantine people. Older people are very susceptible to this. And I'm an old person. You know, my wife is on chemotherapy. I have to be very careful. So I don't downplay the, the problem, but I think our, our government is running, running, a, running just... Amok. Well, they're running a, on, a, on a fear factor. Right. We all know the science behind masks is kind of hokey. Hey, I wear a mask because Hey, if it makes somebody uh, makes them feel happy that I have a mask on, hey, I don't care. Uh, but the science isn't there. Everybody knows the science isn't there. It's a feel-good thing, and we have governments that are making feel-good policies uh, without really. I mean, well, what are they doing to uh, to quarantine older people and, and ex uh, long-term care facilities? Yeah, I mean, it's not. If they'd done it, it was very, very slow at coming. And, uh, and now our economies are, I don't know how these governments are going to afford to do some of the stuff they are because, uh, you know, last I heard the state of Minnesota, we had a, remember before the start, we had a $1 billion deficit. Last I heard we had was a $3 billion, I mean, we had a million dollar revenue surplus. Now we have a $3 billion deficit. In Duluth itself, last I heard, we had a $30 million deficit from the city of Duluth. Uh, now the economy is working a little bit better. I don't know how long that's going to last because as soon as somebody hears that there's a coronavirus case, everybody shuts down again. And the people that are working and, and, uh, and making money flow in the economy are all told to go home and be in their basement bunkers. 
In the meantime, we have a lot of needs to quarantine. We need to get people that are susceptible to this. They have to get that health care. We know how to do it, but I think government is in the way right now. And I think government should do something. But I wish there was a little more science. You know, I, I have a lot of doctor friends. You, know, you just have to do is talk to one of your doctor friends, and most of them are going to just laugh at what the government is doing. They laugh at the mask thing. And uh, it's a feel-good thing, and it's giving false impression this is doing something. We have to stop mass meetings. We know that. We can't see super spreader uh, events that are going on. We, we, that can't go on until all this stuff does get controlled. Uh, but by quarantining the people that should be out working, it's never been done in the past in the history of the world and all the Spanish flu, the diphtheria, the polio. Our economy kept running. Uh, right now, our economy is, as everybody struggling. knows, is very struggling. struggling. It's the worst thing that's happened to our economy since the, since the Great Depression. And I don't know if we're going to survive that, particularly with our governments that are literally shutting everything down. And yes, we have to worry about people that are dying from coronavirus. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, to me, that's a big issue, maybe more so than you. Uh, but we, have to, we can't forget that how that shutting down that economy is impacting uh, people. People, some people, at least read about the suicides are going up, drug abuse is going 800%. up. 800 uh, percent. Domestic, uh, yeah. domestic disturbances. Abuse. Uh, we look at the cities now. We got we got people rioting and shooting people. It's in, in bigger cities. Uh, the, the the murder rate has just just went skyrocketed. Yes, um, it was going pretty good. People were having jobs. Now everything is shut down, and so there is a there is a side effect that people aren't looking at. The alternative, but when you shut everything down, uh, you have a lot of side effects, and uh, that is that people are. Some people are going literally stark raving mad, and we can't stop. We are social creatures. We have been our whole life, or the biology is that we are social. And when people don't dare go outside, and when our schools are shut down, here we're talking about kids, our kids are not socialized, and they're not hanging out with their peer groups, and their people are having children wearing face masks, which does absolutely nothing. I mean, everybody knows that. Uh, except the mob rule that's going out there and saying we have to have even put face masks on children that have zero susceptibility to the coronavirus. And uh, it's making you know, our, our society, I think, very dysfunctional uh, when it comes to being functional. I mean, we don't socialize, we don't talk to our neighbors. You can't even uh, smile at each other because you're wearing a mask on your face. How ridiculous is yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, you know, but I think this is a real serious problem, but we, other countries have dealt with this. I mean, f famous places like Japan uh, had a virtually no cases, South Korea, we got Sweden, they all have different social structures, but they've been able to deal with this quite well. And Sweden stayed open. It didn't shut did. down. And yet next door in Finland, they were sheltered down in place and coronavirus is all over the place there. We aren't hearing on the controlled media the opposite side of this. And I listened to a scientist the other day on the Christian radio station. 83-year-old woman was put in jail. No charges against her. Didn't get a hearing. Sound like you. Um, <laughs> and uh, turns out that Probably the reason that she uh, was put in jail is the last book she wrote was 10 Reasons Why Not to Wear a Mask. And I won't go into the detail of this scientist, but those scientists are not being heard. They are not getting a day in court and hearing what's really going on. And well, so well, it, it, mob it rule continues right. to, to go forth because the media is controlled and the people that are, the scientists and the doctors that are trying to say one of my clients that just came into my storage, he'd had some surgery. And he said, his doctor said, I don't want you wearing a mask. Well, I talked to him a few days later, because another report I heard was a woman um, told me that there was a professional, medical professional doctor, YouTubed, people that have had cancer should not wear those masks. Absolutely not, because you're breathing back in your own um, air, but you're also breathing things from your nose that get on the mask, then you rebreathe it back in again. So I went back to this uh, new customer and I said, 
did you have cancer? Is that why your doctor told you? No. He said, no, I didn't have cancer. It was a surgery for something else. But he said, I don't want you wearing a mask. You now can get a card that you can hang on, your, on you that says medical reasons, can't wear a mask, and nobody can question you that. So there are some opposition pushing back on this, but we're not hearing it. That's the problem. We're not hearing about this. We have mob rule, but we do have some governors that have some common sense in the United States. I got to wonder how their economies are doing. It'd be nice to find out from South Dakota how they're doing, because well, yes, it's affecting our economy. It's very definitely affecting our economy. And the long term is, how much can states and, and the government bail out before there's nobody to pay the bills to bail out everybody that needs bailing out? Are our taxes are going to go so sky high that we won't be able to afford the properties that we have? So then we won't be able to pay the taxes. It's a it's a very big problem, and it's not they're not looking at the whole picture. But for the governors of these states to not look at our our legislator, our le duly elected people like you were duly elected to the school board and your voice was shut out. That's what's happened to our legislature. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I, I disagree with you a little bit on the mask thing. I think that I don't care if somebody wants to wear a mask, that's up to them, but it is up to their doctors. I wish people listened to doctors more than they listen to politicians, but that, that is an issue that we have to deal with. Um, uh, what are you gonna do? I mean. Some states, I mean, look at California. California has, has had an extremely hard lockdown. Uh, their cases are skyrocketing. Uh, obviously, the science has things to be desired in it. I'm not a medical scientist, but I am a rational person. And when you see one state right next door, they have 10 times as many cases or 10 times fewer cases, you know, why isn't anybody putting this together? I mean, the media is making this thing that this is a, we're all, I mean, you look at the media now, every time there's a case, it's like, oh my God, uh, we're all gonna die. And remember when the first started, we really didn't know, people didn't know what was gonna happen. I mean, I talked to my kids and said, oh my gosh, you know, I, I raised you, I didn't tell you that uh, there were gonna be some virus here. Uh, but it turned out, once we've seen the, the, some of the data, it was very clear that this was not affecting everybody. It was affecting mainly older people that already had pre-existing conditions. It was real clear that we weren't all going to die. Uh, and I mean, that was a valid concern when it first started. We didn't know what was happening. We really didn't. Now we do. Uh, we all know that it's still an issue, and I disagree with you a little bit. I think it's still an issue we have to be very cognizant of. But we know we're not going to die. We know that who's susceptible to this. We know it has a lot to do with lifestyle, medical issues, all those kind of things. And uh, we know some people are not affected by it. Yeah, you hear this rare story that somebody young or somebody very fit, for example, has, you know, has maybe died from this. But those are very rare cases. And the media is making it sound like we're still all going to die. No, we're not going to die. We have to look at our life. We have to continue our life. We have our families to support. We have our communities to uh, to support. Uh, we 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 want to keep our schools going. We have our churches to go to. We want to have businesses we can actually go. We want to be able to go to a bar once in a while or a restaurant and talk to our friends. And those are things that are not being talked about. And because people can't have that, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of other negative health effects that are happening because Precisely. of the draconian lockdown. Yep. And I, you know, I do not downplay the, you know, the, the coronavirus maybe as much as you do, but we have to put this in a grain of salt. We have to do our risk assessment, like you said, the governor of South Dakota, she said, hey, I'm putting the facts out there and my people are going to, uh, they are gonna, not going to do something that's going to endanger their life. And we don't have to have government there uh, telling everything what we do. Your point about the governor is now having these emergency powers and usurping legislative authority, it is problematic, I think, uh, problematic to government. And is a governor any more smarter than the legislators? And he can get down there and pound on the table and say, I'm going to arrest somebody, some, some father and his daughter, six-year-old daughter out playing basketball in the neighborhood basketball court all by themselves in the basketball court. I mean, that is really kind of scary. And when you get legislators that try to fight back, uh, I mean, the courts have, I mean, some have been ruling in favor of that, some have not. So it's a tough issue. 
but certainly to say that we have to be in a state of emergency for, for now till eternity is not sustainable. I mean, this whole government plan that they're doing is not sustainable. We have to change how we operate business. Of course, that's one reason I'm running, is that we have to have some common sense. We have to do a real risk assessment. We can't scare the bejeebies out of everybody so they sit in their basement bunkers. I know people that have not got out of their basement for four months. Uh, luckily, some of them have retired or their, uh, their spouses work and stuff. But remember, we still have people uh, stocking our shelves. Our grocery stores are doing quite well. We have people working in the food service industry. These people are all outside doing stuff and working with other people. We have people generating our electricity. We have people gener or making sure we have water. Keeping the sewer plants running, this is, takes a lot of people, a lot of effort. All these things in our society are being done. We have truckers out there working all the time. We have FedEx people dropping our packages off. Uh, and uh, we have bus drivers driving buses. And uh, yet some people have made it elected that they're going to sit in their basement bunker. And sorry, I don't mean to be making fun of them because they have a right to do that. But I do think that people, government should not be scaring the bejeebies out of people that they think that's the only option they have. When the rest of our society is still functioning, our food, uh, our yeah. food industry is functioning, yeah. our, our infrastructure is functioning, our roads are still being built. And I think it's somewhat selfish in a way that people think they can sit in their basement bunkers. And while everybody else is getting out there functioning in our society, but yet a big portion of our people are not functioning and contributing anymore to our society. Uh, so anyway, sorry to get on my soapbox, but I think it's important that some of that stuff is discussed. Rather than my opponents are just talking about social justice issues and global warming and the New Green Deal, I think we have to talk about reality once in a while. Now how much is the New Green Deal costing us uh, and Minnesota Power not being able to give a vital company uh, some breaks. It isn't as if Minnesota Power isn't hand over fist making profits either, because I know they are. But yeah, when you got a business that's struggling and you can't give them a break, it's all about control. And, and quite frankly, as a constitutionalist, I see a total usurpation of our, our constitutional rights, both in the state of Minnesota as well as in the, in the federal government. But let's go on to the police. Uh, we have some time here yet, but I don't want to uh, miss the opportunity to talk about uh, disbanding police departments. Before I say that, I thought of something. So I'm going to back up just a moment. We have an elected form of government. When you look at elected form of government, it isn't one person like dictators. It's several people discussing an issue that comes before them. There's two of us talking here now. You don't get, I don't agree with you 100%. You don't agree with me 100%. We're two different people. And so we have elected officials that are supposed to represent their area and bring those concerns, and then you work it out. Where the way this is operating right now, that's not happening. So you're right. You got one person that seems to think he has the right to make the decisions. But granted, this governor as well as other elected officials, they have their little cadre of people surrounding them that they listen to, and they all agree that we're going to do it this way because that's how you have control over everything. And that's what we're dealing with. This. We're dealing with a handful of people that decide the impact for hundreds of thousands of people, totally against what America was established many hundred years ago to do. They were breaking away from England, the largest nation in the world at that time, the most powerful with the most powerful armada, and a handful of people said, not going to take it any longer. We're not going to be forced by the king to live in America the way he's telling us. And so they broke away from England. They had courage. They had backbone. They weren't afraid. If they lived or died, they didn't care. They weren't going to suffer under a tyrannical government. That's what's going on in America right now. And we're going to get rid of the police? Do you think we got some mobs going around da damaging things right now? I keep hearing about Oregon. I'm concerned about it. I have family out 
not too far away from uh, Portland. But get rid of the police. Well, then who's going to be in control? You know? Uh, That's an issue. Well, I, I think it is. And uh, before I talk about that, I do, I do have to talk about George Floyd. Uh, George Floyd, what happened, if anybody looked at those videos, I couldn't watch that because it was police brutality, uh, clearly. And there has to be, that has to be acknowledged. Uh, but no, those are two separate issues. We have a police brutality thing, which was clear beyond a reasonable doubt that that was police brutality. And that had to been, uh, uh, there, there had to be justice for that. And it looks like we're, hopefully we're going to get some of that, I certainly hope. Uh, so that's, that's one issue which has to be dealt with. Uh, but then to go back and to take that as a stepping stone or a springboard to go through and have rioting, there's a difference between protesting and having rioting, destructive rioting. Right. Uh, the people that say that, oh, gee, the, the, the whole Boston Tea Party was, oh, we're just doing the same thing now. No, it's not. It was a very limited thing. People were not out there destroying their own society, their own society. Right now, as, as we all know, uh, the people, we know people live in the cities. Uh, there is, it is pretty bad in the cities. Uh, we have burning buildings, broken stores. It's still going on in some areas. Some areas has calmed down a little bit, but Chicago, Minneapolis, Portland, uh, you know, all these other bigger cities that hasn't uh, stopped down. And of course, uh, what happened in the in Minneapolis is where it started, of course. And I I think there every right for people to go out and protest what happened because it was police brutality. Uh, which, which did lead to that death. Uh, and I but, agree. But, uh, yeah, I mean, anybody looks at that video, I mean, it is painful. But that's another issue about rioting. Uh, protesting something does not, can, should not be leading to rioting and destroying your own infrastructure, the place that you live. And then to make it worse, of course, which is one reason I'm running, is that what did the Duluth or the Duluth, the uh, Minneapolis City Council do? They voted unanimously to defund the police department. <laughs> now, I don't know exactly what that means, and and I understand that some people were very concerned about the uh, uh, the police brutality in the third precinct. I don't know there, but I'm sure that there's some grounds for having a high concern on that. Uh, but just banning the police department when we have people out there breaking storefronts, breaking their own neighbor's storefronts. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't out there fighting uh, some distant uh, uh, remote power. This is destroying their own neighborhood. Uh, so that's what's happening in Minneapolis. Uh, and that, that is, of course, the, the, the Minneapolis City Council is 100% DFL. My opponent happens to be one of the leaders in the DFL in the state of Minnesota. and. I think taking that whole attitude that we have to dismantle our police does not apply in Duluth. I think Duluth has, is somewhat unique. We're a small city, we're not a big city, thank goodness. But I think our police have been integrated quite well. The Duluth is, a, is part of the fabric, of, or the, the police are part of the fabric in Duluth. And when you start, if you want to tear the police department uh, down, I think that's going to rip the fabric in Duluth. I think it's going to rip the fabric in Minneapolis as well. And when we can see it, obviously, the, their whole fabric, their society is being ripped apart. Uh, and you know, I don't want that to happen in Duluth. Uh, we are not in Minneapolis. I think we people, luckily, are not quite so crazy as that. I don't think there's been the rioting here. There hasn't been, I mean. Part of that is because we do have a police department which is responsive. I do think our police department is quite responsive. You know, I, I, I always, in the school board, I was a champion of the community of color, and I still am. Uh, but I think uh, they know that we have to stop uh, police brutality. But we don't do that by getting rid of the police. And the police are important. We all know the police are important. And, uh, and we have to have, yes, we don't want police brutality, but yes, we do want police. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. They are, I'll say it again, the Duluth police are an important part of our social fabric in Duluth. As they are really with every other community, you have to have something to 
control bad behavior. Yeah. The neighbors are not going to step in and stop somebody from beating up uh, their spouse or their friend or something, or you know, they're not going to step in front of a guy holding a woman holding a gun at another person. They need somebody that's trained to do that. I think our police are well trained, but there's the character in any profession in that gets into a person that gets power is they go a little too far with it and obviously that's happened in more than one situation but then they've got to get rid of that police person and get somebody that is more able to be dealing with a tense situation but to get rid of all of them uh, defund them uh, then let's defund the fire department let's defund anything that has to do with taking care of the citizens. Well, well, the odd thing that I see about you know some of the DFL and the mayor of Minneapolis and Chicago, they, well, this was just people doing their rightful, lawful protests. Uh, no, it's not. This is this is no. this is vandalism. This is destruction of property, destruction of their own neighbor's property, destruction of their city infrastructure. And uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how we're going to get over that, but uh, with, when you throw in the coronavirus, you see the destruction going on in our cities. I'm hoping some people will realize that they should be moving out to places like Duluth and buying our houses. I think we've already seen some surges in house sales and smaller towns. We're part of greater Duluth, and I think we should not be ran by what's going on in the cities. I think we should be ran by people that know our own police department. Everybody calls Duluth a Big, a bunch of big, a bunch of small towns put together. I think we do know our neighbors. We know what we need. What we need is not what the DFL in Minneapolis is bringing to us. We have to sever the ties with the Minneapolis DFL, uh, the St. Paul DFL, and we have to do our own. That's why yeah, I'm a walkaway Democrat. Uh, I got endorsed by the Republicans, but why? Because I want to have some. I want people in Duluth. Uh, I want to talk to people in Duluth and making decisions, not people in Minneapolis telling us how to run our life and what to do with our police force or how to do with our schools. You know, I, want, uh, I want Duluth people to do that and I, I will do that. Well, and I appreciate that. Uh, so then I think the last subject to save the best for last schools, uh, and we only have a few more minutes. Uh, so what do you see as... Um, well, I'll back up. So all I've seen come out of um, um, a situation that I observed from uh, monitoring the school district for over 10 years, the best thing to do is throw more money at it. Throw more money at it. That never solved our problems here. Um, we continually have gone down in the rate of graduation in our area, and I think you gave me figures on that a few years ago. Minnesota used to be one of the top states in the nation on educating its uh, students. We're no longer on the top. We're getting closer to the bottom. I don't know how far down we are, but Duluth itself, um, the education of uh, people of color was, if I, and correct me, the worst in the state. Is that true? Yeah, oh yes, well I did a lot of stuff on the school board. Nobody wanted to hear it, uh, except the community of color. You know, I gave a lot of talks to the community of color and I continue to do that. And you're right, the graduation rate. Now how do you, well, let's go back. What, how do you, what's the metric to measure the success of schools? I mean, you can argue over ACT scores and uh, uh, GPAs and uh, all that. The, you know, what I think the best measure of it is by the graduation rates. And the graduation rate was standardized by the Department of Education. And I'm not an anti-Department of Education as some people. I think they gave a lot of good things. One of it was a standard metric for measuring graduation rates. And Minnesota sits about in the middle of the pack overall in graduation rates. I mean, we're not up you know, the top, we're not at the bottom, we're about in the middle, if I remember right. But where, where it's really striking, and I think uh, verging on criminal, as our community of color is is really bad, uh, and I, I think you know I think there is systemic discrimination you know in Duluth and in our school systems, 
And, and you look at we Duluth. We certainly saw that with Gronseth and Dixon, definitely. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I mean, our, our graduation rates in Duluth are worse than, say, a little town I grew up in, Warroad, Minnesota, has a large community of color, Native Americans. Uh, they are, we're much worse than their graduation rate for kids of color. Our, our African American graduation rate is just atrocious. Their test scores in math and reading is just atrocious. Uh, and uh, so throwing more money at this has not been successful. And we have to look at something more. In fact, I think it's been detrimental. Well, it has been detrimental. You know, you know the red plan. Hey, sorry to talk about the red plan, but they we build five hundred million dollars in new schools. I try not to think of it. And that money from the classrooms, of which just teachers still deny, or, or they don't deny, they know what's happening, but they want to choose to ignore it. You know, the last count that I had, seventy million dollars was pulled from the classrooms to go into the red plan. The buildings. Yeah, and then, so that's one reason that throwing money, that was really great to throw money in the Duluth schools, uh, but what happened is that took money away from the classrooms. And that class, that money could be used to make sure that our, our graduation expectation, uh, which is, is there, that, that everybody understands that, that they have access to how to be successful, how to graduate how to deal with the system. We all know kids have to learn how to deal with the system and uh, they have to know how to do that. Instead, they put it in all these big buildings. Now, this, you, you, and now, of course, we have a really a big problem, I think, is that we have the coronavirus. Remember, everybody, clues, clues were shut down in March. Supposedly, the governor is going to decide what they're going to do and, and I don't know yet. He hasn't made the decision. Don't ask me why he is making the decision rather than the legislature, but he is. And you know, I'll almost guarantee you that the schools are going to stay closed, they're 90 percent closed come September after Labor Day. Uh, so uh, we keep throwing money at that. We have all these massive infrastructure, 500 million dollars in Duluth invested in these facilities and they're not being used. Uh, now this is the thing that I would actually say is that if we're not going to have our schools opened, uh, that money uh, should be going to the parents that are that are now educating their children, uh, and you can talk to any parent that's went through this computer learning. And sorry, that's been a complete dismal failure. Uh, so we have to look at that and taking that money. Remember how much it costs to educate. It's about depending on how you count, anywhere from twelve to twenty thousand dollars per year to educate one child. Okay, if you've got three kids at home and you're a young parents, uh, that's they could be getting anywhere from uh, from forty to sixty thousand dollars to educate their own children, because the schools are not functioning anymore. I think there should be a phase in on that. If the schools don't open in two years, they, they the schools should literally be shut down because they get that money not shut down but parents that don't want to send their kids to the school they should be getting that money because now uh, moms or dads are not being able to go to work because they have to take care of their kids they 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 are homeschooling their kids now I don't care the kids can sit in front of the computer all they want but that's not education and so we have to look at that it's, it's a big issue Marcy and I don't see any discussion on that I see all the fear stories and the fear mongering in the media nobody's talking about what are our kids missing out on? The athletics that they're not doing, the academics that they're not getting. Nobody's taking tests anymore. They're not getting that personal feedback from their teachers. And uh, so the parents are, are there now doing all of that and maybe the parents should be doing that and that's good. But, you know, what are we doing to make the schools accountable to this? And it's, it's just like sports, music, education, not just K-12, but also our higher education things is how are they going to be responsible and do their job? Uh, they obviously aren't going to be doing their job as the way their tax dollars have been laid out. So we have to reassess that, and that is what I'd like to do in the legislature. Well, I'm glad to hear how that. Our society I'm is glad dealing to hear that. With this because yeah. things are changed, Marcy. The things are not going to go back to the way they were. And so we and have we, to readjust our society. We've got to get people back working. We have to reassess things like schools, these big, big facilities. We have to wonder why does everybody have this big, massive, fancy building to have their offices in, engineering offices. Maybe we can get by, if we're going to do it, 
we have to be a little more efficient. And this is an opportunity to do that, I think. And I'm, I'm sorry I have to cut you off, but we are out of time, and I really appreciate um, your coming in today. We definitely could carry on this conversation, but we'll have to close for now. And in spite of the don't here. shake hands anymore, thanks for coming in. Great. See you.